side event in our meeting. Thank you all for, for being here. It's a, a real pleasure. And um, I would like to start to, stay, to thank all the, the attendees and the panelists and to apologize for the, the, the problem of passcode we had this morning. Uh, so please yes, feel free to, to disseminate again uh, to, to your partners, possible partners, uh, the, the Zoom link and this password, um, passcode. And uh, I hope, uh, oh, I think that we can start and I'm sure that we'll have a, a nice meeting and I would like to, to thank uh, uh, all the, the speakers this morning that will uh, uh, present uh, so, some um, experience, share, share the experience and views um, and for the time they took to prepare this uh, side event uh, with us. Um, it's a launch, it's a lunch, sorry, a side event today. Uh, for participants, for example, in Kilimane in Mozambique, in Alexandria in Egypt, in Douala also in Cameroon, and also in Rome in Italy. It's lunch time, so uh, uh, feel free to 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 take your lunch uh, during the the meeting. But please uh, 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 mute yourself for that. But we can see the, to you with, with pleasure. It's also maybe uh, dinner time or breakfast time for others. So enjoy your also your 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 meal during the this uh, event. Feel comfortable with that. Um, so I will just ask you, ask you to mute yourself uh, unless uh, you are speaker for sure, or you want to raise a question or share uh, your comments. And for that, we'll have four Q and A sessions during our meeting. Uh, where you can raise your hand and uh, request the floor to so to pose your question. Um, <clears throat> I would like to introduce this uh, side event, maybe to, of course, to flag that the World Food Forum uh, 2022 is a unique week to put uh, the front uh, uh, on the uh, on young people and how young people are engaged in the food system transformation and the fight against uh, food insecurity. Um, during those um, these two coming hours, we'll speak together about uh, youth engagement for sure in a, a green and a resilient and, and sustainable. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we will speak about youth engagement in a green, resilient, and sustainable future for the cities. And before starting our roundtable, I would like to, to stress our concerns regarding food and more broadly food system. As you know, last year we had this uh, UN Food System Summit and um, uh, uh, a research paper um, has been uh, disseminated, disseminated uh, uh, on, uh, during uh, the, the Food System Summit that flag uh, the true cost of our food uh, and it is very interesting to to have in mind uh, when we discussed uh, about how to improve our uh, food systems that the the food trade amounts to about nine trillion us dollar per year but there are, we have hidden costs uh for food production food processing food distribution food waste management also and those hidden costs amount for uh the double nine more than the double 19 trillion uh, us dollar per year uh, 7 trillion uh, us dollar is for uh are for uh, environmental costs 11 trillion for human life and social costs and one trillion for economic cost. Uh, by economic cost, is the cost that you need to, for example, to clean or to to handle your food waste or to clean your water polluted with uh, fertilizers or pesticides. And um, the human life and social cost are for the the cost that that, that is uh, uh, bear by by poor farmers and poor workers all over the world. Uh, I would like to say uh, that, uh, of course, th those poor farmers uh, and future, gen future generation um, uh, finally subsidize the food we eat every day now. Uh, 
so um, young people uh, will have to pay this cost one uh, one way or another in the in the future. Uh, and the question is that we cannot accept that, and we have to change that uh, right now. So this event uh, is to to explore how. Uh, from a, a young city drillers perspective, we can change that and we can act to 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 improve our uh, food systems and urban food systems more specifically. And for that, we'll have a, a chance to to discuss with uh, ten um, uh, speakers. So let me share my screen if you can see it. I hope so. Uh, with um, sorry yes this slide um with uh, the speakers we who will uh, speak uh, this morning and this uh, lunch time uh sorry i will start uh, uh presenting the green cities initiative and how uh, uh, different actions related to food system and also green spaces in cities can be part of the solution and then uh, Shulang Fei, Fei, sorry, uh, Fei, from the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science will uh, present uh, some uh, research projects uh, based on urban food system transformation in China. And Claudia, then Claudia Laricia, uh, <laughs> sorry, Larissa, from the, yes. Uh, yes, from the Future Food Institute. I will present how um, your organization, uh, Claudia, mobilized youth to, for changing our food system and strengthening urban and rural linkages. Then we'll have a, a Q&A session for eight to, to 10 minutes. Uh, and um, uh, Milka Jane from the Girl uh, Guide and, and Scoot uh, will uh, present how um, May, maybe from Philippines, I think, uh, you are working on how to change uh, nutrition diets and, and behavior among young people. And um, with another angle, uh, uh, a student from the University of Oxford, as well as a researcher, will present how their canteen can be uh, a driver for change and more generally how canteens and, and catering can be um, uh, changed to to reduce the biodiversity losses uh, certainly linking with the, the, the way food is produced um, and then uh, Christina Sosan from the Milan municipality will present part of the uh, food policy of Milan and more specifically uh, focusing on food surplus and food waste and how a municipality can can improve the, the situation. Uh, if, he, if he can join, Flavien uh, Quacha is planning to, to join us uh, at uh, one o'clock. Uh, we'll present some uh, uh, business he's developing in, in Douala in Cameroon on uh, aquaponics. And uh, he will uh, explain how uh, business opportunity can also meet uh, food security and uh, urban development. And then I say to uh, Mobdot from the regional office in uh, FAO regional office in, uh, in West Africa will present solar innovation also and how solar innovations can uh, improve our food system. Then again, a QA session. And then Tess uh, Ayton from the, from the University of uh, uh, Manchester, but more broadly, you are engaged in the in the World Food Forum test, you will present uh, youth-led initiatives across the world, or the, across Europe, sorry. Uh, and Jonathan from the World Food Bureau will present also more broadly how youth um, uh, are making the difference for, for SDG uh, concrete implementation. And then Sarah Milan Honecker from uh, FAO uh, will uh, conclude our session. Thank you also for David Etrebi, who is the host of this event, and Hervé Levitt, who will help the chat moderation. And it's the opportunity for me to flag that you can uh, use the chat for, for sure to uh, share your views uh, and your, your, your reflection. And 
before starting, um, I would like to, to hear you. We would like to hear us, let's say, uh, what we, you have in mind uh, uh, with this uh, topic that we'll discuss uh, this morning and the related challenges. We would like uh, to know your feeling on this. Uh, and, um, and for that, um, you, we will take uh, 20 seconds just using the chat box and um, select uh, all of us, we can select uh, an emoji that uh, best uh, capture uh, our mood this morning on, on this topic and these uh, challenges. Uh, so you can use the, the, the chat and under the chat, I will close, I will stop sharing my, uh, uh, my screen and then through the chat, you can, uh, select uh, the icon that reflect uh, your mood uh, this morning uh, on, on that topic. Uh, so let's uh, select uh, what you have in mind or your state of mind. I, I do it myself. And you can, for sure, uh, introduce yourself. Meanwhile, brother. Happy emoji this morning. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and yes, Davide, <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> if anyone wants to to share something, and then we we'll, we we'll, I will start with the first. Uh, with the first presentation. And by the way, uh, for all the panelists uh, uh, this morning, so of course you can share your screen uh, by yourself and present your slides by your own uh, step by step and feel free if you have any trouble to just to, to, to share and we'll try to fix it with uh, Davide. So, uh, I will start the first presentation uh, on the Green um, Cities Initiative. Let me uh, organize my, uh, my screen for that. Uh, and then I would like to, to to briefly introduce our meeting uh, with the FAO Green Initiative. It can be strange that FAO uh, uh, works on, on cities, but actually uh, it is for sure very, very important as most of the consumers uh, are city dwellers, uh, more than 55%. And nowadays, and uh, uh, in uh, in uh, the, sorry, 2050, we'll have about 60% of the global population living in a city. So it's very important to consider how cities evolve from the consumer side. But for sure, uh, there are other challenges that cities are facing, and uh, re related, for example, to to um, to uh, different aspects from uh, food security to to resilience. Um, I just would like to check whether you can see my screen. Ah, no, not yet. Sorry not for yet. that. Not yet. Sorry for that. Uh, this is the one I wanted to share. Um, so. Uh, the first question that I would like to, to stress is, are cities under siege? Why, why is this a challenging question? Because cities are um, 
um, enduring a very uh, high uh, urbanization pace uh, all over the world, but specifically in Africa and in Asia. And this will change our world. Um, here you can see a, a graphic uh, highlighting the, the urbanization, but with an index uh, 100 in uh, 1990. Um, and uh, then you can uh, compare the, the urban growth from one continent or subcontinent to another. And we can see that Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, but also Northern Africa will uh, have a very, very fast and um, urban population growth and for a long period, starting around 2010 until 2050. And meanwhile, the rural population will increase also uh, less rapidly for sure, but it's not a, a switch from rural to urban. It's a grow, it's a, a specific growth of urban population. And, and this is very challenging in these countries. And we have to, to have this in mind, the urban population explosion in some region all over the world that will change uh, the cities. And then we have also to consider the environmental footprint of cities. Uh, uh, nowadays, the cities are producing 60% uh, uh, of, of the greenhouse gas emission, 60% of the global waste, and they are consuming 60% of the food supply all over the world. And if this urbanization based, all those figures will increase and we have for sure to anticipate uh, needed change to reduce the pressure cities will put on natural resources for their food, but also for all their, um, uh, their, their activities. And then um, with more people, cities are much more vulnerable uh, and specifically to climate risks uh ranging for from uh, uh, flooding to drought and high temperature and those extreme events uh, will occur we know uh, more and more often and cities has uh, have certainly to uh, uh, to cope with that but also to reduce their risk as much as possible and there are other risks related to to economic shocks um uh, because of the covid pandemic because of the war in ukraine and this is all, all of course very challenging for cities in particular uh, related to to their food supply and and the the, the food insecurity and the and sustainable food system we we know all over the world um are challenging for for those growing cities it's, so they, they need to anticipate all those or all those uh, uh, facets, uh, given mainly the, uh, this uh, urban growth uh, they have uh, in the coming years. And just to to have some figures in mind, uh, in Buenos Aires, every year they will have uh, 120,000 inhabitants more in the city. Um, in Kampala, in Uganda, it's nearly 200,000 inhabitants more each year. And in Dhaka, it's more than, it's incredible, uh, that as this agglomeration is so huge, that it's more than 700,000 a year. So a big city every year more. These figures are um, given by the, the UN Department for Economic and, and Social Affairs. And that's right that in some region over the globe, those uh, urban growth is very important. And when we are in Europe, in Northern uh, America, we have to have it clearly in mind this because our urban growth is much more stable and we have, we are, we have definitely not the same context. So with all those challenge, the, um, the FAO uh, Green Cities Initiative try to support cities in building uh, well-being for urban dwellers and resilient cities to trucks. 
uh, and how. Uh, the idea is to consider urban and peri-urban agriculture, urban food systems, and urban and peri-urban forestry together uh, at the local level uh, to integrate uh, and to embed it, to embed those um, elements into urban policy and urban planning. Uh, to what for? To maximize the provision of ecosystem goods and services. And this is very, very important for sure to anticipate uh, the climate risks that uh, cities, cities uh, have to face. Uh, and having a, a better uh, peri-urban forest, uh, better area dedicated to and greater uh, area, bigger area dedicated to agriculture in and around city will help to uh, catch more water, uh, to reduce the, uh, the high heat uh, effect of high temperature. But we have, uh, with this uh, initiative, we try also to foster sustainable and climate resilient practices technology to improve local food production and to reduce so the impact of food production uh, on the on the local resource, natural resources and then the idea is to promote sustainable urban and urban development through inclusive circular economy taking uh, the opportunity of food waste production and food uh, production to close the loop of nutrients for example and on carbon also um, uh, on the food sector and for that the idea is to support local governance not not alone uh, the idea is also to promote a, a local governance uh, including uh, civil society uh, economic actors uh, beside the local governments to uh, discuss and, and build the needed solutions uh, to face those challenge and for that we encourage city to adopt system approach linking together uh, food supply green space but also with education with uh, mobility with economy for sure um, and G just G sorry yes. Gilles, you have to go uh, quicker because yes. uh, we are a thank quarter you. late yes thank, thank you and then uh, uh, to promote rural and urban synergies together because cities are not alone um, uh, cities are doing a lot through various uh, networks, and um, they are all are concerned uh, small, intermediary, and metropolitan cities. And just to conclude my my my, my presentation, to flag that uh, the uh, all those um, uh, all these, these green cities initiative have several uh, entry points depending for sure of the priority of cities of the context of each uh, potential and, and partner cities have uh, ranging from uh, urban and urban agriculture to uh, the food environment to urban and urban forestry or circular economy and food waste and at the center certainly all is based on an enabling environment based on, on local governance with also with access to data uh, to monitor and, and implement policy. So thank you for, uh, for, for your attention. I will uh, conclude here my presentation. And uh, I suggest to, so to, to discuss the, your question in the coming uh, Q&A session uh, after Shulang and then Claudia. So Shulang. Uh, the floor you, is yours to better know how from China you, you implement such approach. Thank you very much, Gilles. And uh, thank you, FL and the uh, Green Cities Initiative team for <laughs> inviting me uh, in this uh, event. And uh, in fact, the institute I work in at CAS uh, is, is called the Institute of Urban Agriculture. And I have been the focal point of the collaboration between our institute and FAO on the GCI <laughs> initiative. And uh, uh, on behalf of the institute, uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation for uh, that. And uh, I hope uh, we, we will have more ideas and concrete actions uh, in the following uh, months and years, hopefully. 
And uh, uh, I think I'll share my screen for my presentation. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Per perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so because it's the workflow forum, so uh, I may uh, include uh, how our, uh, the youth actions are uh, like in uh, Chinese cities in urban agriculture policy and planning. And Shulong, maybe you can, you can put your presentation in slide mode if you want. Yes, slide. Uh... I think it is already, so it's not. So, okay, don't, don't care. Go on. Perfect. And I can't see the full screen, actually, so I need to... Uh, um, okay, anyway. Um, so first, I'll give a brief introduction of who we are. Uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned just now, we are uh, from the Institute of Urban Agriculture, uh, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And uh, in fact, our institute is established just a few years ago. Um, and yes, it's a young institute and <laughs> very consist consistent with the, the topic today. And uh, we are based in Chengdu, which is a mega city. Like uh, with a population uh, more than uh, 20 million uh, people here. Uh, so we think it's very worth to research on and uh, uh, advocating some practices here. And uh, the Institute is also a main unit of the National Agricultural Science and Technology Center, which is an initiative of the Chengdu uh, government. Um, and the strategies of the uh, Institute overall is to grow vertically to maximize the space utilization and uh, to uh, produce efficiently by uh, advancing technologies of farming and to use uh, our uh, urban organic waste as uh, circularly. And also uh, we focus on uh, the multiple functions of urban agriculture, uh, for example, through the leisure agriculture. And uh, uh, we have uh, six research, like uh, six directions uh, in the research center. And uh, one of them is the urban food policy and planning, and that is uh, the team I work in. And in fact, our team is uh, consisted of uh, members who are all from uh, uh, 1980s and two 1990s. So it's really a young team and uh, with a lot of uh, innovative ideas and uh, uh, brief actions, <laughs> in fact. And uh, the aim for uh, our team is to promote the revitalization in the urban rural integrated areas. And overall, we have two main um, rationales in our work. Uh, one is uh, from farm to fork, and the other is uh, to combine, like to integrate the rural and urban areas. And we have, uh, luckily, we, we are able to have a, a good mechanism to include not only research and science in our work, but also uh, to uh, support from the policy perspective and also uh, to have some business uh, within the team, uh, which um, I think will allow our research and our science work to really uh, be implemented and advocated uh, in the uh, in the field. So just uh, briefly for the uh, farm to fork uh, part, we use a systems based and data driven approach. Uh, and uh, two main actions we have here. One is the city region agri food systems mapping, uh, and that's like uh, in in some collaboration with FAO as well. And the other is to identify the key issues along the uh, agri-food systems uh, in Chengdu and for some further R&D innovations. And in fact, we have a smaller working team on uh, AI farming and, and we call it the Urban Digital Farm Initiative, uh, which is led by uh, a youth, like the, the boy in, in the photo as well. 
and uh, uh, this more uh, working group are consisted of winners of the International Autonomous uh, Greenhouse Challenge in the past three years. And they, they are now having projects with, uh, in collaboration with the local county uh, governments and uh, to really not only to do research, the coding, blah, blah, and, and also uh, wanting to implement and um, making them in real in the farm. And uh, for the CRFS work in particular, uh, last Sh year- Shulong, we... if I may, we cannot see, or uh, we still are with your first slide. I don't know if you wanted oh, really? to move from one to another, yes. So, so you're still on the first page? Um, maybe I'll uh, reshare it. You know, when you share, maybe you have to select the, the slide presentation and not the screen. I don't know, but... Uh... Is it moving? Oh. We we can see your your you know your windows uh, with uh, with uh, PowerPoint, but not the presentation itself. Okay, now, okay, what we do? Okay, so uh, I was in this slide. Mm -hmm. okay, can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. okay. And so, so in, in terms of the CRFS work we are doing, uh, last year we started to do a, a policy mapping uh, in the Chinese context from the national policies to uh, the, the provisional and uh, the city uh, policies as well, and trying to uh, figure out uh, and identify the uh, identify the, the the goals for the CRFS uh, in Chengdu. And also in the past few years, uh, we've, uh, we've been in collaboration with uh, FBO Greater team uh, on the resilience analysis case study of the, of the local output system uh, to map uh, the, uh, the stresses and the shocks in the past five years, and also to identify the local initiatives and uh, whether there is anything needed in the future uh, to improve the resilience and sustainability of the system. Uh, the sound is and, not, uh, not good. Uh, sound is very bad. Uh, are you sound sure? is bad? Yes. Are you close to your microphone? Yeah, is it working now? Okay. Sorry. And uh, for the rural urban part, uh, we use a kind of a spatial based rationale in uh, our planning projects for the urban and peri urban agriculture. And uh, basically, we uh, kind of identify the cities into uh, three layers uh, from the interurban to periurban and, and the outskirts uh, suburban. And for each uh, layers, we do think they should have uh, different strategies in urban agriculture. Uh, for example, in interurban, uh, we have a concept that to create a countryside in the countryside scenario kind of uh, in the park city. And in this, we, we do spatial and business model design for intro urban farms. And also we are uh, exploring uh, community, uh, community farming and school farming, et cetera. And for peri-urban areas, uh, we do think uh, 
the, the advanced technologies can be um, should be uh, advocated and implemented in this area on the ground. So, so we are exploring uh, a lot in a coordination mechanism among um, multi-stakeholders, especially uh, between the researchers and the industry uh, actors to kind of integrate uh, the industry needs and the research work. Um, and uh, for, for, for the sub areas, uh, we are promoting the model, modernization of agriculture at the county scale. And there have been uh, many uh, planning projects uh, for modern agriculture for uh, counties in these areas. And we are also uh, supporting seed industry uh, development. And uh, in particular for the interurban uh, areas, we have been doing some more work on uh, interurban farm design and services. Mm, and we have a small working group working on that. Uh, actually earlier in this year, there is an international urban greenhouse a challenge uh, a competition in the, uh, like a group of youth as well and uh, has uh, joined this competition and uh, won the fourth prize. And uh, uh, for this uh, proposal, we uh, really want to do it also uh, locally. And uh, we are now uh, working on the preparation work uh, on a project called uh, Future Farm Modern Agriculture Park, uh, which is a project of the Longquan government in Chengdu. And uh, the photos above uh, are our kind of actions in community uh, farming and school farming. And in the end, uh, a, a small ad uh, for the initiative we are preparing uh, recently, and it is funded by uh, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And we wanted to do a kind of research platform uh, to map uh, urban agriculture and food policy and practices across uh, like different cities in the world. Uh, and we name it uh, for the moment M30, um, uh, many mega cities and metropolitans uh, to uh, make a database for UPA and uh, to uh, do a city net uh, to kind of create a city network and to provide research based solutions. And for this work, uh, it's still at a very early stage, and we are looking for global partners in this journey. And um, if you're interested, just contact me. Uh, and in the end, I would like to thank you to all our. Uh, uh, sponsors and uh, collaborators, and uh, thank you for listening. And I'm really uh, sorry for the issues from my side in the presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Shulang. Thank you very much <coughs> for for this uh, concrete translation from the, the so, some uh, concept I introduced and the reality of the implementation in in uh, in your city and uh, more broadly for the, the um, for the network you you are developing on, on urban agriculture with other other cities and then we can yes maybe with claudia uh, from the future food institute who will uh, uh, present uh, how uh, on those topics you mobilize also use and and act thank you claudia yeah. for you Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be here. Thanks, Gilles, for all your work and commitment. Uh, and thanks to all the, the speakers. So I'm going to share my screen uh, in order to share with you some thoughts uh, uh, and ideas uh, that, uh, um, that I have on this issue that is one of those uh, uh, I'm, I'm working mostly with. Uh, uh, and for sure, not uh, not alone. Um, uh, I'm the head of institutional relations uh, and global strategic partnerships of the Future Food Institute, uh, and the the premise uh, 
uh, that uh, I think is um, absolutely needed uh, before starting talking uh, uh, is the premise related to uh, young people, uh, young talents. Uh, uh, so I have chosen uh, uh, one of the best uh, young innovators that I have met in my life, that is the 91 years old Ennio Morricone, il maestro, the master, as we say in, uh, in Italian. Why Ennio Morricone? Because he basically gave me the inspiration of the difference between uh, young people and uh, uh, not very much young people like me, for instance. Uh, and the difference is the experience. Uh, so he used to say that in order to innovate and in order to uh, keep uh, uh, watching the world with the proper curiosity that keep us young, uh, we need to forget uh, the experience. Uh, we need to forget, uh, again in Italian, il mestiere. That means the craft, uh, uh, the expertise. Uh, uh, so we need to abandon the prejudice that, we, that our experience gave us uh, in order to uh, really be uh, powerful. Uh, and that's the spirit how um, I work with young talents uh, and I work uh, a lot uh, with, uh, uh, together with the Fisher Food Institute, but even with, uh, with FAO, with many, many, um, um, with many organizations. Uh, um, so, uh, given the spirits, my contribution is divided into basically two parts. Uh, how we can transform the inspiration and all of the speakers, uh, Jill uh, included, uh, gave us inspiration about the cities of the future and the future of urban food systems, uh, transforming the inspiration into action. That's the reason I'm here to tell you uh, which is uh, the um the best practices that uh, as a future food institute we basically are implemented uh, the united nations uh, uh, remind us uh, that we are in the decade of action uh, so we should stop talking about some issues because we already have all the figures the numbers uh, and we um, know very well the perfect Form of crisis uh, that humanity is facing, and above all, uh, young young persons. Uh, here, there is a slide on the Future Food Institute. So we work uh, uh, on food innovation and its impacts uh, on knowledge, innovation, and community. We are all over the world, as you can see here. Uh, but basically, we are building the cities of the future with our own hands. And by the way. Whoever wants to cooperate, we are very open ecosystem. Uh, so the cities of the future are the models of today. We need uh, uh, to uh, build the seeds of the future, and that's why we are we already built uh, um, many leading labs. Uh, three of them are very well iconic uh, of the topic of today: green cities and young talents. In Scuderia, in Bologna. Uh, we have a leading lab with the food labs, uh, uh, with uh, the possibility to taste innovative solutions with uh, the Gen Z. We have more than 3,000 Gen Z people per day. So by the way, we, we really wait for you in, uh, in Italy, in Bologna. Uh, Gilles, uh, you are in Rome, so we definitely wait for you. And then we have the Paideia campus uh, that is in the south of Italy, completely different. Uh, it's a tiny rural village in Campania region. And we um, founded a Paideia campus on integral ecology. We work with young talents and we work with FAO a lot. And in particular with the FAO e-learning academy led by Cristina Petracchi. So we trained since 2019 more than 1,000 uh, climate shapers from more than 100 countries. These are the cities of the future, the cities where you are able to train the citizen of the future. Again, we should uh, have a systemic thinking to put uh, humanity at the epicenter of the change we need, because uh, we all know we are causing the perfect storm, and then we are the first uh, um people that are affected by the perfect storm finally we have uh, a leading lab in tokyo in the kiyobashi area with the tokyo tatemono 
so FAO and the Future Food Institute uh, uh, are working since, uh, uh, as I told, three years. Uh, you can check on our check on our website, uh, futurefood.academy, uh, all the uh, programs that we have with uh, uh, FAO. And of course, you can join us. Which is the inspiration? The inspiration is the current situation. Uh, the planet is already composed by citizens, or as Pope Francis would say, humana comunitas, uh, that is, uh, uh, is sick, is broken. So we are living in a planet that is dying from hunger and is dying from obesity. Uh, you all know the figures about the young people obesity, children, but also um, adolescents. And so uh, it's very important again to change their mindset and give them the opportunity to uh, change their lifestyle. Um, then we have, uh, as Gilles already said, uh, uh, the picture of the cities of the future. Uh, and we have many different uh, quality aspects related to the urban areas. So given the same number on the to total population, we are a composition that is completely, completely different. And that is very important because uh, uh, Ennio Morricone talking about the experience and of course we need to take into account also uh, the age, the health, the lifestyle, the possibility to have access uh, to healthy food and to innovate in order to understand how can we grow? Um, how can we feed the growing population uh, whose 70% will live in urban areas in a sustainable way? This is the, the, the question, sustainable and healthy, uh, because so far we have the 70% of calories came, coming from uh, uh, processed food. And then we have the pandemic. Uh, we all know, I'm sure that we all know, uh, how pandemic affected uh, young people. They jumped like uh, two years uh, of their adolescence uh, and they are in the middle of this perfect storm of the climate crisis, cultural, economical, health, environmental, energetic, political. Uh, and this is affecting a lot the mental health. Let's not forget as adults uh, this issue. Uh, we have the figures that are very scared. So the raise of uh, problems related to mental health uh, uh, in just one year is of 40%. Uh, it's something that we never saw before. Uh, so, okay, we want to empower young people, but what about uh, the limitations they are struggling with? Uh, uh, and that's why it's very important. Uh, so it's better together to face uh, these uh, uh, challenges. You can see here some of our best partners we are working with for young talents. Uh, Food for Mind is composed by doctors. Uh, so we are working with them on health, uh, physical and mental. Dora Academy is a digital transition academy that is very well focused on ethics. Uh, uh, and and uh, we, you know, sometimes young people uh, have this misunderstanding that the digital tools uh, uh, are uh, the goal they have to reach. No, they are tools. So we need ethics again to use them and to express um, themselves, of course, uh, their thoughts, their feeling, change of planet. Aurora is a training project for under 21 young talents. Uh, Youth Climate Leaders Network, the National Association for Innovation in Italy. So we, together, and of course, also together with FAO, with the United Nations, with all of you, we can, um, we can have the seeds of the future and build the cities of the future for the young talents. Um, uh, which are the examples uh, we are giving as a Future Food Institute? I'm rushing a little bit on these slides because I'm very scared uh, of the male voice that can tell us that we are really late. So solutions, uh, we have uh, boot camps with FAO. Uh, on the cities of the future, on regenerative kitchen, regenerative agriculture, on climate smart ocean, regenerative farms. These are the topics uh, of our digital academy, but also of the boot camps in presence. Uh, 
Uh, and here you can see what we have built with FKO so far in the past three years. Uh, Polica, the tiny rural village I was describing to you. This is Polica. We are in, in a castle of 1,200 in front of the sea, in the middle of Mediterranean diet culture of Parmeni, the Melisso, Zenone, of the Eleatic school, because to be young, we need many, many years uh, and awareness of the story and culture. Knowledge, community, and innovation are the main pillars. Again, best practices. We have a digital academy with the DOT Academy, youth and digital transition for a sustainable future. Do not forget the ethic part that sometimes young people just forget. Uh, Wefts of Mediterranean, so youth people for the future. They are recollecting plastic from uh, uh, the beach, from the sea, and they are using 3D printers uh, to create art crafts. Uh, uh, handmade by themselves. Uh, they are meeting the nature, uh, the, the beekeepers, uh, the farmers, uh, and they are using uh, the digital tools, the, intellig the artificial intelligence, the internet of things uh, to create uh, new languages to interact with the old values uh, that we really want to keep feeding. And that's the integral ecology model. So we have uh, in the epicenter of this new model of sustainable development, uh, far from talking about SDGs, we are doing something uh, uh, that embody uh, all the 17 goals uh, in Polica. So we have the political dimension, the food for earth, that by the way is the title of a book, two books we publish with FAO, human regeneration, social, cultural, economical, this is the holistic approach we need to put into the cities. And that's why we have the Regenerative um, uh, Academy and we are working at a European level with the Cities 2030. That is a, a European project with 40 organizations. Again, young talents are the epicenter of our leading labs and so our European projects, as well as it happens in the Kiyobashi Living Lab in, in Tokyo. Uh, and uh, these are the faces and the voices of the future, according to us. These are the food and digital influencers from Africa. So they have a community uh, together of 2 million people in Africa, Zambia, Nigeria, um, Kenya, and we are working with them. We want to raise their voices. They are uh, uh, very, very powerful and we are cooperating with them. And by the way, we choose to raise the voices of Africa through these uh, beautiful ladies, uh, and not only ladies, um, from uh, for the World Food Day uh, on Instagram channels, because we really want to uh, speak the same language of young people with, uh, let's say, the possibility to give back opportunities and raise their voices. I feel- uh, Claudia? Yeah, I finished. Yeah, uh, yes, in, okay. In the COP27. You're very welcome. On November the 8th, we will be on Sharm el Sheikh in the Italian pavilion of the Ministry of Ecological Transition for an event on what? On the cities of the future, on green cities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. I just react on the, on the chat, flagging that I would like to be younger and to join your living labs. <laughs> Of course you can. <coughs> Morricone was 91, so you can join us uh, if you forget the experience. And thank you for merging from heritage to digital tools <clears throat> in order to, with this holistic approach also, uh, and this holistic uh, vision to help uh, young people to, to reshape our future, future, food, uh, future food. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank so you. we... We have been very, very long to, I have been very long to introduce this meeting and to present, uh, to make my presentation and then we are running after time. But uh, I think it's, it is uh, worth to, to have a, a Q&A session at, at the moment uh, of five minutes for any clarification, any uh, 
uh, further details that you would like to have in order to uh, from Shulong, from Kodia or from right side in order to to better understand our purpose and or our words and uh, and uh, maybe to link uh, together it could be a question or a comments so let's take some minutes all together so if you want to to raise your hand to unmute yeah. yourself there was just a, a first question jill uh, from uh, Aisha to mm -hmm. uh to to too long to 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 know you know what is the most challenging part of uh, the activities in china you know and she responds directly, but perhaps you want to, to take the floor again, uh, Shulang, to explain your challenges. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think um, and difficulties are everywhere, especially for youth, because you you are always have limited resources and limited attention uh, from the society and uh, from the uh fund uh, sponsors <laughs> etc and uh, uh but in terms of the crfs work i'm doing uh, at the local scale i mean like just in my case uh, i find one thing uh, difficult for me uh, is uh, the the very like smooth communication of some these kind of new ideas with uh, some governmental authorities because they are kind of in the framework of their uh, own uh, working style and uh, uh, for example agriculture is agriculture and commerce is commerce uh, and consumption is consumption they uh, sometimes they they don't think they are uh, a kind of in, in a kind of a system thematic uh, approach and uh, but indeed that's uh, what we are doing and i i think it's worth uh, doing this uh, in the city uh, to to promote and advocate this kind of approach and concept um and uh, to try to educate and uh, like in, in many uh, ways to uh, to align it with the current priorities and uh, and to to uh, implement this approach and uh, contribute to the local uh, food system sustainability and um, uh, and uh, gradually we do have some uh, projects uh, for for our team team's research work. So that's a very good sign. Uh, and also uh, we, are, uh, we have found from uh, the Chinese Academy uh, of uh, Agro Agricultural Sciences and uh, uh, also in some collaboration and communication with FAO, which is all very good. Uh, good things for us to uh, to continue our work. Uh, and uh, I do believe uh, this concept and this kind of uh, new uh, approaches uh, will be uh, prevailing uh, someday in China. Yes. Uh, another question Thank is uh, another question is from uh, from many of you that want to join this uh, living labs. Uh, Claudia, is, is it possible for people to? to come visit and uh, how, how does it work? Uh, they, do they have to write to you? Yes, you can reach me out, but um, they are physical spaces that are open. So uh, anyone, anytime can join the living labs. Then if you want to do something more like uh, uh, use the food labs uh, or live uh, uh, a, food, a future food experience, uh, it's, uh, it's better to write to me or the president, uh, Sara Roversi, uh, or our colleagues, uh, uh, because we organize uh, these future food uh, dinners or experiences, like using, uh, uh, um, I don't know, the coffee waste for creating uh, mushrooms uh, or the fermentation, the kombucha uh, or uh, pasta or biscuits uh, are made from uh, the waste of the process to produce beer, for example. Uh, and, and so it's very nice because you can combine the pleasure to live uh, uh, a very unique experience with uh, uh, the, the sustainability in your plate. Um, so we wait for you whenever you want. 
Great. Perhaps, Sergil, we, we just go, go on because we are very late. Yes, ex yeah. thank you. Thank you, Hervé. Uh, you are the timekeeper of this meeting. Thank you very much. And it's an hard work. Uh, and now we'll uh, go with uh, Milka. Milka, you are for, from the World Association on Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. You are based in Philippines, uh, if I'm not wrong. And I will pass your slides. Uh, so yeah. uh, let me share my screen and, and the floor is yours. Sure, Thank sure. Thank you for being with us. Thank you also. Good evening from the Philippines, everyone. Um, welcome to the meeting room, to this very engaging yet informative discussion today. On behalf of Ms. Elisha, Elisha Jai Kachua, a 17-year-old girl power nutrition advocacy champion, WAG's representative, I'm going to read her statement for this event. Unfortunately, she has caught a cough and tonsillitis, so she cannot speak right now. Despite that, know that she is here with us, listening to all of us, so later on, if you have questions, feel free to message her via her email address. First things first, I am Elka Jane Camisaria, also her fellow youth leader and WAGS representative of the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign, and also a girl power nutrition advocacy champion here in the Philippines. So let us start this comprehensive presentation that our panelist Jaika has prepared. Let me read the statement that she wrote. Learn with me. As we are about to change nutrition diets and behavior among young people in the Philippines, um, is it okay to have um, the next slide, please? Sorry. Thank you. The table of contents are as follows. Number one, situation here in the Philippines. Number two, girl power nutrition. Number three, what we do. Number four, goals in the long run. Number five, what more do we need to do? And number six, lastly, youth can. These are the topics that we're going to talk about before we proceed to situation analysis. Let me read this quote, quotation first. The foods you choose make a difference. You are what you eat. So feel free to raise your thoughts about this quote in the chat box and our panel Jai Kachua will be reading it now. And later on, you will realize how important it is to be wise with what we eat to con to contribute to the betterment of food systems in various cities. Next slide, please. Now here's the situation about nutrition in the Philippines. The Philippines is grappling with severe malnutrition with high prevalence of wasting, stunting, micronutrient deficiencies, and overweight among children and women. Poor infant child feeding is indicated by an increase in stunting from medium prevalence 17% in children aged ages six, 6 to 11 months to a very high prevalence, 36% aged in children aged 12 to 23 months. In 2019, 33% of children under age of five years old, 4 million children are stunted and unlikely to reach their full mental and physical potential. And obesity rates of adults have nearly doubled over the last two de decades, up to 31% contributing significantly to public health problems. Next slide, please. Since we already identified the problems, we're also proud to introduce the Girl Power Nutrition Program. The Girl Power Nutrition Program, um, next slide, please. What is GPN all about? Next slide, please. Um, our Girl Power Nutrition Program supports girls to learn to learn, girls learn about food nutrition, take action. Girls take action in their communities and speak out. Girls use their voices to create about local, national, and international levels. Girl power nutrition vision. Healthy and well-nourished girls are able to reach their full potential and are empowered to take action to break the intergener intergenerational cycle of malnutrition with the support of the Sustainable Development Goals number three, four. The GPN badge is available in three age ranges in younger, middle, and older stage. You can access the GPN sources in the link below provided. 
who, what about us? Who are the advocacy champions? The GPN Advocacy Champion creates girl-led change through a series of educational campaigns on the importance of a balanced and healthy lifestyle and enabling girls to be an agents of change at the local, national, and global levels in the fight to stop malnutrition, continuing from one generation to the next. Indeed, GPN, the GPN program is a great avenue to promote better nutrition, better lifestyle for all. And at this juncture, presenting here the past programs and activities that we did inside the GPN program that reached thousands of people in the Philippines, especially young women and girls. First, the GPN project launch, which is shown in the screen. It is a GPN 2.0 project launch in the, that was held last year. Next slide, please. The second, National Nutrition Month 2021 which calls for all sectors to focus efforts on the first 1,000 days of life as the strategic intervention to prevent stunting and obesity. Next slide, please. And also, we have our Buwan ng Wika and GPN. We incorporate our national language, Filipino, to the Girl Power Nutrition Program. Next slide, please. The thousand 21 regional campaigns. Regional Nutrition Month 2021, Wika ni Maria Clara campaign. NutriQuiz Zards, a day with the Wellness Bowl team, adventure to GPN, grow, protect, and nourish, and celebrate a World Food Day. She rises for her campaign, Vaoji, Violence Against Women and GPN collaboration. Here are some of the documentations. For more info, please visit and follow the Wellness Bowl in Facebook. One of our, one of the documentations are the TWB Project Launch, launch Northern Luzon's Regional, Regional Nutrition Month Celebration. Next slide, please. Wika ni Maria Clara, NutriQuizards. And next slide, please. And lastly, Adventure to GPN and She Rises for Hunger. So these are some of the highlights that was highlights of the programs that we have given for girls in the Philippines. Now the question is, um, next slide, please. Sorry. Now the big question is, what can we do? What can youth do? Before we answer that, let us first identify the benefits of eating well. Next slide, please. A well. A well-balanced and healthy diet will provide the energy to require to keep active throughout the day, nutrients important for growth and repair. It also helps you make you strong and healthy. And lastly, it helps prevent diet-related illnesses as some are, for example, cancer. It is really important to know these things for it will inspire or motivate us young ones to be better at choosing healthy eating habits, as this also contributes to the world's sustainability, food security, and food systems. Time to take action. How can we contribute to creating sustainable food systems? This information was inspired by the Yunga Nutri Equal Lab last May 2022. First, we support locally produced food. Choosing to purchase locally grown food is an important way to support your local economy, contribute to your community, improve your health, and do your part to protect the environment. Getting involved in the local food system help us gain back the separation created between humans and food production. Second, promote eco-friendly packaging. By doing this, you're saving nature. You are sharing disposal and recycling best practices. Buy only what you can consume and plan your meals. These are necessary and are simple steps to create sustainable food systems. What else? Next slide, please. Educate yourself. It is very important to educate yourself, to be aware of what to eat, what to do with consumed food, and what to do with leftovers. Engage in nutrition related activities programs or companies. Engaging yourself in an, in an event like this 
will not only benefit you by learning from the members of the panelists, but also how you can further take action or how you can effectively, effectively advocate your cases, especially on nutrition, eating habits, and behaviors. Talk it out, share your voice, and spread the word. Simply have a conversation with a friend, peer, or your family to connect with them and learn from each other. By doing this, you are spreading the word, the campaign, and telling your audience to have a healthy eating habit and lifestyle. Practice healthy lifestyle or living in empower to join us in taking action. Of course, that is the last step to take action. Apply all your lear learnings from step one as much as possible. Encourage, empower, and inspire others to join us in this advocacy. Empowerment is a must. We must verbalize and we must fight our cause and create a ripple effect of empowerment when equal opportunities are given to men and women. The impact is multiplied thereby having a ripple effect. Before I end, Elisha Jaika will also would also like to include a topic on pinggang pinoy, as shown in the screen. The pinggang or platong pinoy depicts a plate with color-coded portions representing the different food groups that should be on each plate. Pinggang Pinoy is a new and easy to understand food guide that uses a familiar food plate model to convey the right food group proportions on a peer meal basis. This will help Filipinos acquire healthy eating habits needed to attain optimum nutrition. Next slide, please. Who should use this healthy diet guide? It applies to all ages, regardless of their background, gender, belief, etc. Ms. Elisha Jaika would like to thank everyone for listening and active participation. If you have any questions, feel free to send it via her email. And also, in conclusion, eating a healthy balanced diet and keeping an active life will help us maintain a healthy weight and prevent illness by the youth for the youth. We are heading in a greener, more resilient, and more sustainable future for the cities around the globe. Hashtag youth can. Thank you. Thank you, Milka, uh, for this energetic presentation and very interesting. You have a comprehensive program of action that is clear that you are very uh, a, a, a central actor of the food system in the Philippines. Incredible. Thank you very much. And we'll come with some questions uh, uh, in few in few minutes. And before that, we would like to learn more about uh, how the the youth in in, um, in uh, British universities in the Oxford University consider uh, this challenge to improve the the food we eat and to reduce their side effect. And uh, and so. Uh, Niam and Eleonore, you, you have the floor to, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Eleanor, have you got the oh, Yes, I will share my screen. Can everyone see the slides? I can. Yes. And do they change? Yes. Yeah, OK. Right. <laughs> That's good. Cool. OK, um, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I'm Neve, um, and I'm a biology student at Oxford here, um, and I'm currently doing research on quantifying the biodiversity impact of agricultural expansion and intensification and climate change and urban expansion in this big tool. Um, and yeah, I've been involved in bits and bobs um, research here and there in university as well, um, and also a bit outside with um, real food systems which is a non-profit um, so although I haven't met a lot of you here today I've heard about your organizations and it's an honor to be here so yeah Eleanor um, hi I'm Eleanor Hammond and I'm a research assistant at the University of Oxford um, and my research focuses on um, the environmental impacts of food and how to use the information that we have and the data that we have to um, enable people to make more informed decisions on their food um, and yeah, thank you very much for having us today. Okay, could I have the first slide, please, Eleanor? 
Okay, a fun, or oh, if you consider poetry fun, a fun start to our little presentation. Um, this is the final stanza um, from a poem by a famous um, from a poem by a famous poet called Jim Hopkins. Um, and I decided to start with this um, because it was written almost 150 years ago, and it basically contemplates how bad the world would be without wildlife. Um, and it was really ahead of its time uh, with regards to what's happening now with climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And much more topically for today, um, it can be appreciated through kind of the lens of city dwellers, um, because we in cities are really far removed from the wet and the wilderness. So Eleanor, next slide, please. So yeah, as has been discussed already, um, it's really hard when you're in a city to kind of conceptualize um, your environmental impact, um, that your environmental impact on the planet and all of its species. Um, in, in Oxford, for example, there are opportunities to kind of have allotments and grow things in your own garden, but not everyone has access to this sort of green space and especially youth, um, as we are often students or workers in flats. Um, but yeah, agriculture is uh, the biggest driver of biodiversity loss globally and threatens 86% of the world's at-risk species. Um, so how can youth in cities kind of do their part um, to address this um, horrible scenario? And we basically chose canteens because canteens are kind of a halfway point between university students in cities um, and their impact on the environment. So if you act through them, it, they can kind of be a medium for change. Um, and it only takes a quick glance at the plant-based milk section in the supermarket to see how much um, consumer-driven change can help um, the planet and stuff. So yeah, um, next slide, please. So yes, to address the disconnect nowadays um, between public perception and the reality um, behind the food that ends up on our plates. Um, in my first year here, I made a little handbook for my um, university canteen that basically took sales data um, and converted that into the canteen's environmental impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, water use, land use and pollution and everything. And basically from that designed hierarchical interventions that the canteen could use to reduce their impact quantitatively so that we could really track our progress towards biodiversity net gain, for example. Um, and I'm going to pass the floor over to Eleanor in a little bit um, to talk about how that's been scaled up, because that was done about two years ago now. Um, and I think the note that I'll leave my half of the presentation on is that since I wrote this little report for my canteen, in Oxford at least, it's been scaled up quite a lot. Um, other canteens kind of wanted their own um, handbook to kind of look at their impact. And that is kind of smoothly where Eleanor comes in, where she's kind of been scaling up the project to make it um, more accessible to lots of different canteens in the city. So with that, I'll pass the floor over to her. Yeah, so um, since I've been at Oxford, I've been trying to scale up this process. So converting the, the calculations and analyses from the college food reports into automated calculations and algorithms to essentially automate the process to try and develop this into an easy to use tool. So the, the thinking behind this is that this would allow canteens to do this analysis much quicker, um, much more cost effective, and also allow them to do it multiple times so that they can track their progress. Um, so the, the figure on the right um, outlines the general framework that um, Neve's work and, and my work is following. So first, it's important to understand the baseline food environmental impact. So as Neve said, different metrics that this can be measured in. So carbon emissions, um, land use, water use, biodiversity impact, an estimated biodiversity impact using um, species area relationships, um, water pollution and other metrics so that the, the caterer can, the, the, the canteen can understand um, what, what the biggest drivers of their food, food related environmental impacts are and what those look like to start with and then set smart targets so that um, they're measurable and within a specific time frame for their impacts, their food related impacts um, in terms of carbon emissions and biodiversity, but potentially other metrics as well. And then working out um, 
different ways to different cumulative actions that could sum to meeting these targets over time. So these could be um, based on diet swaps, but also trying to switch to more sustainable um, supply chains um, and then also compensatory actions after the kind of impacts from the food consumption have, have happened. So um, maybe dealing with food waste more efficiently um, and then also thinking about mitigating actions and proactive conservation actions, either locally or globally um, at the sort of end of the framework. Um, and yeah, so this is what I've been doing. Um, and so future perspectives and what we've learned from um, doing this work. So we're trying to overcome some barriers in terms of how canteens would be able to use these tools. So um, throughout my work, I've been engaging with the the catering teams that would be using these kind of tools and trying to understand what barriers currently exist for them to implement um, this or do do these analyses um, kind of over time. Um, and then thinking about leakage and risk perception. So consumers might go elsewhere if the changes that the canteen need to make in order to meet these targets happen too abruptly or are too um, kind of top down. And then engaging in further youth um, outreach to engage, engage with people to inform them about how important food decisions are in terms of global biodiversity, climate change. Um, another another big thing that's been be, like research that be, that's been done by other people at the university is trying to implement eco labels in canteens. So these are kind of um, score systems to put on dishes so that you can have an estimate of what the environmental impact of that dish is to help um, young people who are eating in the canteens to make more informed um, decisions. Um, and then there's the Nature Positive Universities Network. So Emily Stott, who's I think she's on this call, um, is she manages this. So this is collaboration between UNEP and the University of Oxford. Um, and it's a network and there's people from around 500 universities in the network. Um, and these universities, um, there's, you know, there's pledges coming in from different universities around the world to commit to carrying out four steps for understanding their impacts on um, global biodiversity. So basically baselining their impacts, setting targets, understanding actions to reduce these targets and reporting. Um, and this encompasses food, but also other activities that the university engages with. Um, and there's Nature Positive Student Ambassadors Network of around 75 global students. Um, so Nature Positive Universities is encouraging students in different in the different universities in their network to undertake this kind of research for their institutions so that um, their own canteens can work out how to understand their food related environmental impacts, but also how to kind of communicate this to um, their consumers. And we're hoping that um, we're able to develop tools like the one we're trying to describe today that we're trying to develop to support these universities and, and students to um, do these calculations and so this is a way for um, for young people to potentially get get involved or make a difference in their canteens um, and I'll put a link in the chat to Nature Positive University's um, website if anyone's interested um, so yeah that's all I have to say thank you thank you so much uh, Leona Eleonor and, and uh, Niam for, for this very interesting also presentation and, and concrete action uh, through this uh, all those data available, this tool available for, for caterers and consumers uh, to make their choice and to, to better understand the, the, environmental, the environmental impact of their food supply and their food consumption. Very, very, very interesting also. And that meet uh, some of the points of the true cost of food uh, for sure uh, thank you very much and then be before uh, the next uh, q a session the floor is to christina sozan from the milan uh, uh, municipality uh, and milan is in charge also of lots of canteen so maybe you are challenged uh, challenged by by the those young uh, researchers and students from the Oxford University, maybe you will have to implement this tool also, no, in your yeah. canteen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you also for all the other presentations that were very inspiring. And um, 
So uh, actually Milan has uh, a lot of experience in terms of school canteens and in terms of uh, uh, healthy diets because um, thanks to uh, the great uh, work that we are uh, doing uh, since 2015, but also before, uh, I, I must say the long tradition for the public um, school canteens means that Milan have since the 19th uh, century. Uh, in the last five years, we have been uh, through uh, several changes that uh, dr uh, drove to um, um, a, a very um, uh, big impact on the, on the issue of healthy diets because we reduce a lot of the use of meat and we introduce more legumes. But uh, also in line with all the other um, speakers said, we did a lot of, and we are doing a lot of communication uh, activities because we have seen that it's very important to focus on this, on education, on awareness raising, both on young people, on very young, because we have, uh, we deal with, um, uh, with um, children um, from zero to six and from six to uh, 12. So the very, very, since the beginning. So we are trying to, to work on the menus uh, in order to let these people uh, and, and these child children uh, in, eat well, but also to inform the parents. And uh, I try to share the screen just to, um, to give you an example. Mm -mm, if I see it. Okay, let me just check because it's not here anymore. Okay, it's here. Okay, can you see? Okay, can you see it? Okay, so this is the menu, just to, to give you an idea. This is the menu that we print together with our service provider. We print it twice per year and we give to all the kids in all the schools that we serve uh, in order parents to have this, um, this menu uh, um, available, for instance, on the fridge and where we put all the dishes, uh, the type of dishes, if the dishes are organic or not, and more or less uh, ha more than half of our uh, diet are of our ingredients are organic but also we put uh, another important thing according to us that is a second page it's in Italian so I will try to explain to you that are advices and particularly on what the uh, the girls before me were saying um, the researchers this is like il contrasto allo spreco alimentare that means how to fight food waste so it's some advices that we would like to give to parents in order to uh, reduce their food waste but also to inform of what is the company and the municipality is doing for instance in school we give we provide the children with a doggy bag call it doggy bag we don't call it doggy because in italian say doggy uh, bag is something that you, you eat something like your dog so it's like no we we call it uh, save um, save food bag so uh, we give it to the children and the children can bring home fruits and bread if they don't eat it uh, we, um, we opened a lot of projects with the charities in order to let them come to the canteens and bring the food that is um, still good uh, in terms of bread and fruits as well, because the rest of the food in Italy cannot be donated, the food that has already been cooked cannot be donated um, if it's not monoportion. Um, and then we are doing a lot of, uh, a lot of work on research through Horizon projects, for instance, uh, in both uh, in two sense um, and in two directions. The first one is trying to reduce uh, food waste through the um, increase of the appreciation of the plates, of course, and of the meals. Because uh, probably, you know, and also um, as the, the researchers before have presented, it's not so easy to make little um, children uh, to eat uh, vegetables and, you know, legumes and stuff like that. So you, you have to try and to try to, um, to make them aware that they are very good, but you have to also to cook them well. If not, it's always the same plate, it's always the same recipe, and it's really, it's really hard to do that. So we are working a lot on that as well. Um, we are also working on another project that it's called the fruits, middle morning fruits, uh, where we um, bring the fruits uh, as a middle morning break in order um, 
to have an healthy, uh, an healthy product and to avoid families to give children uh, other type of food. And also because with food, if the kids eat food, they arrive at the meal with uh, mm, a lot of, you know, uh, more hungry and they eat more and the waste is less. So this is what we observed. And then we, uh, we don't serve the fruit at the, at, the, at the end of the meal. So the fruit doesn't go mm, to waste. So there are quite a lot of programs in terms of um, children and schools, but also in Milan, we have uh, another big, big program that is uh, this one, that is the, the, the food waste the food waste hub. So we actually have five uh, food waste hub in the city of Milan, where we collect uh, food waste from supermarkets with the help of charities. Uh, so we have, as I said, five hubs around the city, uh, and we have uh, a lot of charities that are working with us um, through a very positive, uh, I, I should say, network and cooperation system where they manage, uh, I mean, the food that arrives there, they select the food, and then through other networks of charity, they distribute the food to the people directly. So it's also another thing that is, I think it's important. The people is not queuing for having the food. The food is brought at home uh, uh, or in the place where they can you know, uh, come and, and, and pick it up. So we are trying also through this program to uh, raise awareness also on supermarkets and big stores in order to make them more aware on uh, you know, the dates, the expiry dates, the way they, cons they use and they uh, conserve food, and also trying to make with them some uh, training on you know, be more responsible also in donation. And we also give them incentives because if uh, restaurants or private sector donate food, they can give, uh, they can access to an incentive in the reduction of uh, the tax for the um, waste of the waste tax. So I could talk for uh, hours, but these are the main uh, the main ideas. Just one thing, uh, because it's related to the um, guidelines also that uh, um, the university um, researchers presented before. Also in Milan, we. We tried to involve, actually we did, we, did, we involved uh, a lot of universities from Milan. We made an analysis of their catering system and we tried to uh, put in uh, um, a book that we will issue next, uh, next, in the next weeks, uh, some guidelines for the healthier and more sustainable catering system. Also, according to the Cool Food Pledge Initiative, that is also monitoring, for instance, our school canteen system and how good we are in uh, you know, reducing our GAG emission through the changes in the menu. So these are some of the actions that we are doing in Milan. Thank you very much, Christina, for this interesting also presentation and very concrete. From a, a city perspective, you have also to, to act uh, to to provide some services uh, to for for needed for vulnerable people for the school canteen and uh, and it's uh, very very interesting to have this clearly in mind. Uh, so we have uh, another Q and A session. We are very late and we apologize for that. Maybe for the next speakers, but I don't know if Flavien is here. Uh, Seth, maybe not. I haven't seen him, but so maybe we'll jump to after to Aisa too directly. But um, could be nice, and then we'll have, sorry, and then if we start with Elsa too directly, Tess and Jonathan will come just after, and we'll have a last Q&A session at the end of the meeting. Maybe we'll be late with five to 10 minutes after two, but let's jump to the possible question you have, uh, questions you have around the table to uh, Milka, Niam, Eleonore, and uh, Christina. On the chat, there's no no questions, more remarks, um, and information given by by your colleagues. Something I want to ask, if it's possible, Gil, uh, to our colleagues from uh, Oxford University, they, they said that they, they are going to the to the COP fifteen in Montreal uh, to talk about that. Uh, the nature positive uh, initiative universities. So uh, can they explain uh, 
how the imagine what, what will be the, the outcome of, of this pledge at this uh, very uh, uh, event of the, the COP. You know, do, do they do they are looking for, for support, uh, finance uh, for projects? Uh, can they explain a little bit, Emily, please, and Eleanor? Uh, hi, I'm happy to answer that question. I guess I'm uh, no more than Eleanor. Um, so this is uh, a broader, what we're announcing at COP is, a, is our broader Nature Positive Universities program. So it's not only food, but it's asking universities to make a pledge for all of their operations and supply chains uh, to address the impacts on nature. So currently the um, event at COP is really just a kind of announcement of our founding group of universities. So we have from now until then, to encourage any links you have at universities to sign up and ask the vice chancellor or the sort of senior management to make this pledge um, or engage with us if they have any questions. So it involves four steps. They don't have to have done anything already, but it's a pledge to look at their baseline of their impacts, set smart targets, carry out actions to meet these targets and report back each year on their progress to reaching this nature positive. So that on balance, their impacts on nature are positive. Um, yeah, I don't know if you need anything else, feel free to um, contact us directly. Uh, we haven't quite decided the event. I think it will be part of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration Restoration Day, I think 15th or 16th of December. Excellent. Interesting. Another question? Uh, perhaps I have another question. If, if nobody. And to the Milano. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the, this policy of uh, Milano um links to the canteens etc is it uh, uh taking uh, its origin from the the milano pact well uh, yes. it, it, it's not taking origin but actually they developed together at the same times because after the expo we did two two main issue two main actions so the first one was at local level with the definition of a local food policy with five priorities. And one of these was reducing food waste. And on, on the same, at the same time, we also developed the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. We started, it started with 100 and 100 mayors, and now they are 250. And actually, this issue of um, sustainable, sustainable and healthy diets is one of the first uh, um, topic for the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. According, we just finished our um, meeting in Rio de Janeiro, as you probably know, because you you were one of the partner, and. Um, we, we have seen that the practices sent by for the Milan Pact Awards grown a lot, uh, have grown a lot for the um, yeah, sustainable and healthy diets, but also for food waste, because a lot of cities are also uh, now starting to work on food waste and make a connection uh, with food waste, agriculture, producing compost, more circular economy projects, but also to um, you know, uh, avoid poverty and to increase the amount of food that they can collect and then give to uh, vulnerable families. So these two categories are probably uh, the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, for the Milan um, Urban Food Policy Pact. So if you want any information, yeah, there is the website. Excellent. So uh, there's a question for you also from Etienne, Etienne uh, who wants to collaborate with, uh, with Milano uh, on, the, on the chat. Yeah, Etienne, yeah. you can perhaps take the, the floor. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to know if you can hear me clearly. Yes. yes. Okay, 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 okay. I'm in a very busy place, so I'm sorry. I would have to leave my camera off. Um, so my name is Etienne Essien. I I am from Nigeria. I run Sector Green. It's a it's a company that is focused on sustainable agricultural processes. So what we do is that we we try to create campaigns on um, curbing food waste and food loss along the food chain. You know, as well as um, we run a farm, a black soldier fly lava production farm, where we process food waste into black soldier fly as a as a, as an alternative for protein for animal feed production. Um, currently, we've we've been on our 
pilot research on black soldier fly and the different um, substrates, the, the different waste streams that we can process with black soldier fly. You know, I came across um, um, this webinar and I decided to join. I, I'm really glad that I joined because it's very good to see a lot of people around the world doing a lot of things about food waste and food loss. You know, so back to Bleano, I would like to know, um, I mean, I'm open to collaborations, especially on campaigns um, to create more awareness on food loss and food waste. Um, I know that, I mean, um, we're, not, we're in different countries, but if it's possible for me to do something in my country, you know, maybe sort of replicate what she's doing, just so as to further create an awareness. Um, so yeah, pretty much that's it. And other people also who are willing to collaborate. Uh, I'm open to that too, yeah. And thanks for these questions. Maybe I can share the, the email of the MUFPP, so the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact Secretariat. Also because, for instance, in, in Africa, there is a regional forum of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact with all the cities that signed the pact and that actually have presented uh, also many practices. For instance, Kilimane in Mozambique is one of the, is one of the special mention of this year on, on a project for uh, you know, food waste collection for the production of compost or other. So they are trying to connect all the markets of the city. So there are quite a lot of experiences from the, from the African cities as well. So maybe we, we could try just to, also to, to have um, to visit also the website and to see what the African cities also are doing, but also the other cities and uh, also in order to try to understand if you can or if you are already cooperate with your uh, with the city of you are coming from. If I understand well, you are a company, right? Uh, you are presenting a company, not a public institution. So uh, one of the things that, that we would like to um, uh, to stress is that it's very, very important for us, for a public administration to strengthen the stakeholder engagement and particularly on the um, private sector, but also on public company, for instance, that are dealing with uh, food waste, uh, water waste management, all the type of, you know, uh, mm, public companies that uh, uh, could be assets you know for the public institution in order to make some pilots for milan it's easy because we have school canteens is public uh, water management is public as well uh, some other services are, are half and half so uh, yeah it, it's a, it's an issue it's a, it's a challenge but uh, there are some experiences that we can share so i'll share here the the email of the secretariat for you excellent we give the floor yeah. to Cla claudia Oh, sorry. Do you want to say? No, no, no. Uh, please, uh, no I, I wanted to, to reply her, to, to, to reply Christina. Um, yeah, so we're, we're a private entity, but we have a lot of CSR, um, corporate social responsibility programs that we carry out. Um, for example, we are, on a we are currently on a, on a corporate social respons um, responsibility program to um, work with over 8,000 farmers in Nigeria, in Southwest Nigeria, on effective... Um, um, animal disease control and effective um, waste management on their farms. You know, so while we are a, a private entity, we try to, to do all of that to ensure that we, we create impact in our environment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Claudia, we give you the floor just one minute because- uh, Yes, we yes still just one minute. Um, uh, so I was adopted by Milano. I live in Milano. So congratulations to Christina and the municipality for the amazing work they are doing. Uh, Milano was awarded uh, uh, by the Prince William's uh, Herzog Prize for the food waste. And Future Food Institute uh, is part of this European project in Milano that is Open Agri, a peri-agriculture uh, project uh, that allows to uh, feed uh, the population in a sustainable way. On top of that, we have Massimo Bottura, that is an ambassador of the UN, a very popular chef uh, that is working for the social impact with his uh, refectorio of uh, Food for Soul. Uh, so um, I just wanted to underline that the complexity of the city of Milano is very well uh, uh, embraced by municipality and its ecosystem we are part of and we wait for you to be uh, part of. Thanks. Thank you. We, we continue, uh, Gilles. Yes, thank you, Claudia, and thank you all for those comments. 
sorry to cut the q a because we could have much to to say and to discuss with all those experience from uh, philippines to england to to italy but uh, we would like now to give the floor to aisatu uh, from yes. um, from dakar for the fao regional office for west africa to discuss and to present some works on on solar energy and, and food systems so oh, thank you jill Thank you everyone for your presentation. Can you hear me right now? Perfect. Thank you very much. So I will first uh, share my screen. And if we can count on the last speakers for five minutes presentation could be very nice. Sorry for that. All right, we will try to rush the presentations. So first of all, thank you everyone for being here. So today, my name is Aisatu. As presented, I'm a solar energy engineer intern at FAO Subregional Office for West Africa. Today, I will discuss about the solar innovation as a um, sustainable solution young people must harness. So first, I will explain about the potential of solar energy. Did you know that the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth, which is 1.37 kilowatt per square meter, when 100% converted can cover the world's annual energy consumption in only one hour? So on your right, you have the world solar potential map, and we can see that the potential is here in Africa. So next, I will talk about the types of energy, and I will try to do it as simple as possible so that um, people not majoring in solar energy can understand. So from solar energy can be derived three types of energy, the light energy, the photovoltaic energy, and the thermal energy. There are several technologies applica applicable in each case, but the, and the merits of the light technologies is that they have simple design and require no energy, com com no energy conversion. In contrary with the photovoltaic, the solar panels you may already know, and the heat technology. However, the advantage with the solar panels is that the research and development to reduce the system cost is still ongoing. The common point is that they are kind to the environment, they provide energy security, however, they are all weather dependent. So next we will talk about innovation and green technologies available to contribute to the Green Cities Action Program of the FAO. So we will start with the food production, we have the example here of a simple solar irrigation system that for crop production in urban areas. I'm sorry, I will just drive my pointer here. And this in these technologies, we have the mobile solar panels and water pumps in Kenya. So here we have also the hydroponic and vertical farming with solar energy for water and fertilizer and use of light necessary for the plant. It's also possible to use solar energy in agriculture machinery, solar water pumping or fertilizers spray. So next about the food waste management, several composting technologies are developed in urban areas. Some use only the solar heat like this one and some combined like here solar panels and solar collectors. So also, we have the another technique that have been mentioned by Mr. Eschen, the black soldier flies. So in farm, for, for the farming process of the black soldier flies, we have the need of control, controlling the light intensity, the temperature, the moisture. So in all of these cases, solar energy can be used to cover the energy need of the fly farm. Concerning wastewater management, in addition to the existing technologies, we can use distillation phenomena, which requires the solar heat. In the system, wastewater pass through this box and end up treated at the outlet. We have also in the field of agro-processing, the use of solar technologies like here for crop drying, which is very common to reduce the food loss. And you have also on your left, that example of drying, fonio drying, in Senegal, and also here, a drying technology for small capacities. There are also solar milling technologies that can be used in the market in urban areas where the dishes mainly are based on cereals. So next, I will talk about food conservation. 
So food conservation is very important for de to decrease food loss in the urban areas. So there are refrigerators that can work with the thermal energy as well as the photovoltaic energy. So here you have the example of a company in Nigeria that pr provides service on the field and in the market in urban areas. Also cooking during daytime can be done with the solar technologies like here. And here we have the example of Ngai Mehe, a city in Senegal, where this technology is contributing a lot in fighting deforestation. Lastly, here you have the in, in your right, you have the example of the net zero energy building. So this is a building which, which is an off-grid building and can cover all its energy needs using the solar technology installed on it. So this also this concept can be used in restaurant as done here to promote decarbonization. So I really rushed my presentation and I will conclude um, here. I would like to emphasize on, on three points, it's like whether in urban or peri-urban area, luckily most of the agricultural activities are done under the sun and we have the solar potential here. So we must take advantage of it to build a better life for city dwellers. Also, I'll, as all these green technologies can bring opportunities to make urban and peri-urban agriculture rewarding for youth. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Aisatu, uh, for this very interesting presentation. And we have to count on, on the sun to find some solution to, to uh, reduce also the climate change impact and to, to develop further our food system to, to respond to our need, but in another way. Thank you very much. And now we'll change uh, the presentation. Oh, no, we will. Uh, um, run from a, a techni some technical solution presented by ISATU uh, to come back to um, to uh, uh, to um, uh, sorry uh, uh, awareness raising and advocacy with uh, Tess Ayton and Tess Ayton I think that you you are part of the organizer organizer of the World Food Forum if I am not uh, mistaken and you will present some uh, youth-led initiative across Europe. Yeah, are we ready to present now? Yes, thank Great. you. I will just share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see it now? Not yet. Okay. Maybe you have to select the screen. Yes. There we go. Yes, perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, Phil. We are, my name is Tess Aiton. Um, I study plant science at the University of Manchester. Um, but I'm working at the moment at Kew Gardens in London, where I am um, researching drought tolerance in palms and yam crops. And alongside my studies, I work for a food systems consultancy, trying to make urban food systems more sustainable, uh, specifically in food retail and logistics. And I'm also a focal point of the World Food Forum, uh, the, um, the WFF, as I'll call it in this presentation. So all week we've been uh, rushing around organising the youth assemblies that have taken place um, this week at the World Food Forum flagship event in Rome. And yesterday we presented those findings um, to the DG and the chief economist of the FAA. <clears throat> so what is the, um, the World Food Forum? Well, it was launched last year. Um, it's an independent, youth-led global network of partners facilitated by the FAO. And it aims to empower young people to actively shape agri-food systems as a contribution towards the sustainable, sustainable development goals. It aligns with the outcomes of the 2021 UN Food System Summit acting as the major youth platform in global food governance and serves as a global think tank that fosters youth-led innovations in science and technology. So today I will showcase four youth initiatives from across Europe. I mean we've already seen some incredible um, youth initiatives um, in, this, in this session um, but I'll just add a few more to really highlight how young people are already driving positive change across the continent's food system and why collaborating with and investing in youth is essential if we want to accelerate the transformation in our food system. 
So let's start where it all begins, uh, food production. And urban agriculture, we all know, can improve access to fresh and locally produced food and generate employment. But it often goes beyond this. It's an excellent way for communities in towns and cities to connect with each other, their environments, and to learn about nutrition and food cultivation. I want to highlight a youth project in Portugal run by the Equasso uh, Cooperative in the town of Amaranth. Since its creation in 2006 by a group of grassroots fair trade organisations, the cooperative has coordinated dozens of projects. And this year, its Urban Garden Youth Exchange involved, involved 30 participants from across Europe. And the main goal was to support the creation of the town's future urban garden by constructing food and garden, uh, garden waste recycling facilities that you can see in the pictures here. And these facilities will provide a sustainable source of natural fertilizer in the years ahead. I'll be quick. Oops. <clears throat> Secondly, let's look at food distribution. Uh, specifically the issue of so-called uh, last mile delivery. And that's the final link in the supply chain, transporting foodstuffs from a hub to their ultimate destination, whether that's a business or a home. The problem is that delivery points may be miles apart and the actual delivery loads are, are usually small. And this increases vehicle movements in city centres, traffic congestion and emissions. So a recent study by the Global Food Security Centre at the University of Cambridge suggested that these impacts can be minimised in densely, uh, in densely populated city centres. Nonetheless, making last mile delivery sustainable will be an increasing problem as urban populations rise. And this is the problem that Food Logica is aiming to solve. So Food Logica was founded in Amsterdam by Jessica and Francesco, Francesca, and after they left university. Um, it's a smart logistical service designed to optimize local food systems uh, using refrigerated e-bikes and e vans. It's a, it's a solution for businesses that do not have to do not have a structured logistics logistics system that need to optimize costs and want to minimize their environmental footprint by becoming more circular. So and the project has expanded across the Netherlands and has now arrived in Milan and Paris. It features strategically sited peri-urban hubs powered by sustainable electricity sources, ensuring the punctuality and high delivery standards valued by the company's customers. So a great example of a youth-led business there. <clears throat> Thirdly, food consumption. So in the UK, where it was where I'm from, uh, one of the richest countries in the world, research by the Food Foundation Think Tank estimates that two and a half million children regularly miss meals because of poverty and rising costs. And FAO estimates that 800,000 people in the UK may not eat today. Whole communities find themselves living in what are called food deserts, where there are no sources of fresh food or food swamps, where the only food options are unhealthy. So Food Wave is a pan-European program which aims to educate and engage youth in all parts of the food system. In Manchester, our local section of Foodwave wanted to demonstrate that sustainable eating habits can be affordable and accessible. We created a pop-up cafe in a deprived neighbourhood of the city. We cooked a nutritious three-course banquet for around 40 people using local produce. We received wonderful feedback and residents enjoyed connecting with each other around, with each other around food and they particularly appreciated the take-home recipe cards we designed. So we're planning to host similar events each month uh, around the city and create activities for new university students as well, which will focus on cooking quick and easy meals that are healthy and sustainable. So finally, food waste. Um, so research for the European Commission suggests that around 88 million tonnes of food is lost or wasted annually across the EU. I'm sure we're all aware of the um, impacts of food waste on our food system. <clears throat> And the cost of this wasted food is estimated to be around 143 billion euros. Uh, so today I want to tell the inspiring story of Adam Mullins. Um, he's a 20 year old from Ireland that I met yesterday at the conference. And Adam was motivated to take action against food waste, to reduce food poverty and take action against climate change. He was inspired by his mum to set up a student pantry in the city of Galway. And the pantry is a space for students to collect free food that would otherwise be going to waste. So Adam uses the online platform Food Cloud 
to which is um, available across Europe to identify groceries from supermarkets that would otherwise go to waste. And you can see, hopefully this video will play, um, the scale of, of the food left behind. So that's just um, some of the fresh vegetables that was collected in, in one collection. <clears throat> so uh, Adam and his friends drive across the city centre uh, three times a week to collect these items. And in just 12 weeks, uh, he estimates that the pantry's work has reduced carbon emissions by 16,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Over the next few weeks, he expected to have the capacity to serve between 1,000 and 3,000 students every week. A really amazing youth initiative. So you can see, young people are already having positive impacts on the problems of the food system through actions at local, national and international levels. Across the world, we are challenged by unprecedented problems and we need to be open-minded to develop effective solutions. Young people can be leaders, activists, and sustainable entrepreneurs. Our impact is, is limited, however, because of a lack of systemic approaches and slow implementation of innovative solutions. Youth can bring creativity, optimism, and unique experiences to the table. And meaningful youth engagement increases the sense of ownership and attachment for young people in the community, helping to drive innovative solutions. We hope we can help you to solve the world's food problems. Together, this event, we hope, will create an opportunity for future learning, inspiration, innovation and collaboration. And by involving and working with youth at events like this, so thank you very much for the invitation, we can strengthen our ability to collaborate, negotiate and problem solve. And that will enable youth to become uh, better leaders for the future. So to summarise, in order to accelerate and expand these youth initiatives, um, we encourage you to listen to us, hear us and work with us. Trust us with your resources, open doors and networks, and we will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Thank you very much. And even if you think that some actions are limited uh, to uh, regarding their, their scope, they are very inspiring, and I'm sure that they are an excellent driver for change, also for the parents, no, and for 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 the family. So, uh, one one action maybe covers many people's uh, and invite them to to change their, their behavior. Thank you very much. We are very late, and I would I'm pleased to give the floor to Jonathan um, from the World School Bureau. But Jonathan, I'm very sorry. Could you try to reduce the, your speech to the main points you would like to share with us uh, before we can conclude our session? And uh, thanks to Test Worlds, I just would like to 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 share that we'll try to to share the the emails and the presentation and and the link to the record in order to maybe to facilitate some liaison between between you. So Jonathan, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having trouble showing my uh, screen. Would you mind? It doesn't seem to be working. Maybe it will help you to to go straight to some points you would like to to okay. to yeah. emphasize yeah. This on. Yeah. No, in that case, then I'll just I'll get going. Um, thanks, Maxine. I see Maxine's uh, sharing it. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, for those who, who don't know me, I am Jonathan Pinar. I am one of the Africa Regional Youth Representatives for the World Organization of the Scout Movement. Uh, I'm part of the Environment and Sustainability team, and uh, our advocacy efforts are sort of amplified and ampli are, are aimed at amplifying youth voices on issues relating to climate change, responsible consumption, clean energy, and sustainable development. Um, I've lived in Johannesburg most of my life. Uh, and Joburg is reputedly uh, the world's largest urban man-made forest. Uh, as you can see there uh, in the, on the slide, as I speak, the jacaranda trees are all in bloom, and it just reminds us the number of trees within the city. Growing up over the years, I've seen the impact of rapidly expanding cities without adequate supporting infrastructure. Uh, here in Joburg and other parts of South Africa, we are currently impacted by severe water shortages and blackouts due to huge demands on the respective grids. So 
I think I think it goes without saying that today's generation of young people has witnessed its fair share of crises. Uh, our world has been transformed by an explosion in global trade and consumption, as well as an enormous move towards urbanization. We are seeing massive rural urban migration, a glowing go global population, corruption and territorial conflicts. Evidence in the latest food security report from the World Bank highlights that climate change continues to place increased pressure on traditional farming practices, which results in poor crop yield. As young people, we are part of the world's largest generation in history, with Africa dubbed the world's youngest continent. The youth population in sub-Saharan Africa is expected to double by 2050. I believe this is the time to put the phrase, nothing for the youth without the youth, into practice more especially prioritizing the voices of marginalized young people, particularly those in the global South. The youth have an increasingly strong social and environmental awareness. We, the youth, have the power to transform our societies towards a low carbon and climate resilient future. However, we cannot do it alone. This has to be a collective, uh, collective participatory, transformative and sustainable efforts. Young people should be recognized as key actors in raising awareness running educational programs, promoting sustainable lifestyles, conserving nature, supporting renewable energy, adopting environmentally friendly practices, implementing adaption and mitigation techniques. Youth involvement in such important issues should not just be part of a tokenistic box ticking exercise, but truly transformative, where we are recognized as partners for sustainable development, with capacity building being provided where it is needed. As one of the most important factors in moving towards a sustainable future is to ensure everyone is educated in ways which consider the environment, as mentioned before. As Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. This quote for me speaks to the importance of all forms of education, more so education that happens beyond the uh, walls of the classroom, non-formal education. Non-formal education is an important tool that can be used to ensure different members of our communities learn, unlearn, and relearn habits that are beneficial for both the planet and the people. Recognizing non-formal education is an important aspect of education and is one of the first of many steps that can be taken to, con uh, to contribute to greener cities. In Scouting, we are already doing that. As the world's largest non-formal educational organization, Scouting empowers the youth to develop skills and knowledge in building a better world. This allows for youth members to play an active role in society and contribute to a future which is more sustainable and inclusive. Through one of our flagship initi initiatives, Scouts for SDGs, we have contributed over 2.7 billion hours of community service towards the sustainable development goals, with just over 1 billion of those hours going towards SDG 2, Zero Hunger, and SDG 11, Sustainable Communities. This shows the youth's willingness to participate in creating green cities and creating solutions to food insecurity. We are, we are engaged in numerous advocacy efforts, such as having youth representatives like myself, who amplify the call to action at various levels or writing thought pieces such as those that were submitted as part of the Reach Not Preach campaign. Other examples can be drawn from the scouts in the Philippines practicing urban agriculture or scouts in Fiji who made their backyard gardens and inspired the community to follow suit, or scouts in Sri Lanka who, took, who, who work on sustainable ways of growing food at their local school by planting trees, or Connor Huey, a scout from the United States of America who is training the next generation of change makers through an exchange program between the Washington state and Spain. I've personally also been able to see how scouting uses sustainable solutions to solve the food shortage issues as I've been involved in organizing the Food for Life campaign at my home scout group. This campaign teaches scouts sustainable, sustainable ways to grow food using various gardening techniques they can use at home. The scouts then learn how to sow and maintain various vegetables. Then in collaboration with the local soup kitchen, the scouts go out to various points within the community to provide food for those in need. While this doesn't address the systemic issue of poverty, it contributes towards addressing an immediate crisis. There is a need to couple micro efforts to reform with bigger picture structural reforms that ensure that the creation of greener cities does not worsen the plight of those already marginalized. Solutions such as these are important and these examples show the importance of not only youth education on skills and knowledge development in greening cities, 
government, civil society, and the private sector need to recognize non-formal education as an effective approach to ed environmental education. It is also important to include young people in decision-making. Governments and other organizations should create more opportunities for youth to increase their participation in environmental related policy processes, recognizing young people as rights holders to this agenda and understanding that decisions made today will impact the health of the planet young people inherit. Thank you for your support today and commitment to making this world a better place for us in the present and for our future generations. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It was very inspiring also to, to consider that uh, informal education is uh, bring by action, is brought by action also uh, for the health of the planet and the health of the people also, as you mentioned. Uh, thank you so much. We are so late and I haven't seen specific questions on the chat. So um, if there is any... Uh, 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 burning question you we could try to consider it uh, before closing the meeting but if anyone raise his hand now or in two seconds i will maybe ask sarah to close the meeting if you are here sarah Yes, I'm here and I'm happy to take over. I was just waiting is there, if there is an urgent question, but it seems like there is not. So yeah, also hello from my side. Um, and first of all, get well soon to Alasia. I have the same problem. Also, I caught a cold. So I hope my voice will stay with me throughout the closing of the session. And um, I feel like now would be the time to say it is my honor to speak, but actually I want to say it is my honor to listen to you and it was my honor to stay with you here now and to have learned from you. And it is great to hear from so many bright young minds who have understood that the issues around food systems cannot be put into boxes because we would need a box as big as the whole planet in the end to allow for a systemic approach. And uh, in the seemingly gloomy situation that we are in yet, um, when the current challenges such as food insecurity, the effects of war and healthy diets and climate, not only knock at our doors, but actually are halfway into our living rooms, it is sometimes easy to lose hope. Um, and this session was one of those when I really regained a lot of inspiration and hope from you and your presentations. And um, I think this also showed a really nice way forward. And to push forward, I would like to highlight four cornerstones that I've been hearing throughout your presentations and also um, through the discussions. And the first one is about making connections. And um, first of all, to overcome the urban and rural divides, such as mentioned by Niam, for example, because in the end, it's artificial and it's an illusion. We need to understand that we're not disconnected, but actually highly dependent on each other. But connection also means to team up with policymakers, with communities, NGOs, farmers and consumers to reach a holistic approach. And I think Tess um, has showed us a wonderful example of how people from across borders, from across backgrounds can be brought together in order to achieve that. And I also think that today's event actually um, has been a great event to to connect people and uh, I've been very happy to see in the chat that people were actually reaching out to one another and making those connections live that we were speaking. Um, connection also means to get more people in our team and uh, this means that those people who join the fight they need to make informed decisions that involves communication, education and information and I think campaigns such as the ones highlighted by Christina are very strong on that to show how communication can be tailored. But also Jonathan was highlighting this in Doberg. And connection finally also includes to close the circle from the production through the food retailing and consumption towards the waste. Um, and I think this was also excellently tackled by um, the Milan municipality, but also was taken up by Etienne from Nigeria in the chat and by Tessa, so I feel it's really beautiful to see that people have understood that we need to close their circle and take the whole system into approach. A second cornerstone I would like to highlight, um, and I've heard from you, was the smart agriculture. We need to find smart solutions. And um, we've heard examples from China to England, how data can be used to convince people in the community 
but also in institutions such as university canteens, government entities, and so on, to advocate for more healthy food systems. Innovations can also help us to include solar systems into our agriculture and take up new technologies. And the third cornerstone I would like to highlight is tailored action. The action that I've heard from you that was inclusive, that was gender sensitive and also aware of local contexts, such as, for example, the impressive actions that were taken by the scouts from all over the world to their communities and that were highlighted by Jonathan and Milka, which did not only benefit the people um, in the scouts team, but also the people most in need in the local communities. And that, I think, is excellent but also making use of local conditions, such as I said too stressed, when taking the disadvantage or seemingly disadvantage of a burning sun and putting it into an advantage and using the solar power that's in it. And in the end, I would like to highlight one point uh, that I just call optimistic and energetic persistence of youth. And um, <laughs> I know the structures and behaviors, they are not set in stone, but sometimes they might appear just as a jungle. And Shulang said in the beginning that for her, it's really hard to reach sometimes the right people and convince them. But I think if we see structures as a jungle where we can get lost, we can also see them as a jungle which grows and which changes its shape. And that's important to see. And for that, I think we need the confidence of the more experienced people in power to not only provide us with spaces such as this one, but also as Claudia has mentioned, to understand that to be innovative, we sometimes need to forget our experience. We cannot say it's impossible just because we've never seen it. And I think that is really important to keep in mind. And <laughs> before my voice completely fails, I want to get to a second point that Claudia mentioned that I found very impressive. And she said, the cities of the future need the citizens of the future. And when I look around in this virtual room, I feel very blessed because I'm surrounded by so many inspiring citizens of the future. And I think we've seen that the solutions are already among us, and not only in ideas, but actually in action and practices that have been taken out to the world and proven already. And there I call again out to the more experienced colleagues to take in these ideas and to open the doors and accommodate the youth. Take them seriously um, because they are well prepared. And I could sense that their energy is long from running out. It is actually growing. And we have had a lot of energetic presentations here, and I don't want us to get rid of this energy now that we get out of the Zoom meeting and just keep on with our busy days. I would actually like to encourage you now to um, take a pen and a paper if you are as old fashioned as I am, or take your notebook if you want to, and write down what are you going to take away. Let this meeting be a bit more than just a LinkedIn connection or another buzzword. Take down the time and just note down what is important for you. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's an idea, maybe it's something you would like to look up, but write it down and also note down how you would like to use it to shape the future you would like to see and also the future that our planet so urgently needs. Thank you. I think I can't say another word. Thank you so much for that inspiring day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for all the panelists, all the participants today. And um, take your pen, take your notebook and uh, write what you what you plan, as uh, Sarah said, what you plan to, to take from this meeting. See you all and we can close our meeting now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.